Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back again to Latin American Directions. My name is Nicholas Sussman, and we're back with new shows after a short pause. Today, we have our guest, Santiago Vargas Nino. Santiago is an international lawyer and is very interested and keen about Colombian politics or Latin American politics overall. Uh, and we're going to unpack the results of last Sunday's election in Colombia. Um, the unforeseen win of a left uh, candidate. Um, and yeah, we're gonna see what this implies for Colombia. Santiago, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Latin American Directions. Thank you very much, Nicolas. It's a pleasure to be with you and hello to all of your viewers. Thank you. Uh, so Santiago, maybe let's provide a bit of context to the audience. Uh, what happened in Colombia in this election? Who's Gustavo Petro? Who's Francia Marquez? Let's just set the ground uh, to see what we will be discussing tonight. Of course. So um, we have presidential and congressional elections uh, every four years. The last one was in 20, 2018, uh, which elected a majority right wing Congress and uh, a right wing president in Ivan Duque Marquez. His government was characterized by uh, an opposition to the implementation of the 2016 peace agreement between the Colombian government and the FARC rebel group, a surprising levels of corruption and um, carrying favor to political clientele and uh, an unfortunate increase in violence, inequality, and poverty as a result of the emergence of new organized armed groups and also the coronavirus pandemic that struck Colombia very hard, leaving an estimate 140,000 Colombian citizens dead and uh, basically erasing 10 years of fight against poverty and inequality. On the other hand, you have a very prominent leader of uh, the left, Gustavo Petro Urrego. He used to be a militant of the M19 rebel group, which was pretty well known for its the spectacular actions in the 1980s and early 90s. Um, for instance, this was a guerrilla group uh, that stole the sword of Simon Bolivar, the liberator of um, vast swaths of uh, Latin America from Spanish imperial rule, um, or the unfortunate takeover of the Palace of Justice in Bogota in 1985, which ultimately led to the murder of basically the entirety of the Colombian Supreme Court of Justice, as well as several visitors and service providers at the hands of the Colombian military, mostly. He demobilized in 1919 as part of the M19's decision to return to peaceful ways. And he has been a prominent leader who has occupied several roles as a congressman, mayor of Bogota, and leader of the opposition to Ivan Duque. His um, candidate for the vice presidency is uh, Francia Marquez Mina, a, an Afro-Colombian woman from the Cauca region in the Pacific Basin. She has been well known for her activism in defense of the environment. So for instance, she, in 2016, she won the prestigious Goldman Environmental Award for her work against illegal mining in La Toma municipality in Cauca. She conducted a, an, an independent uh, campaign as uh, for the, let's call them the primaries of this election under the banner of a communal Afro-Colombian movement called Soy Porque Somos, I Am Because We Are. And uh, she obtained 800,000 votes, which were even higher than the tally of votes of the center 
uh, coalition primaries and the far right uh, coalition primaries. So she became basically a uh, banner holder for a number of different social and environmental causes. And Gustavo Petro finally decided to make her uh, his ally for this election, which they just won uh, with um, 11 million votes, uh, a bit over 11 million votes, which is the higher voting that any left-wing party has ever received in the history of Colombia and facing a rather <laughs> particular um, competitor in Rodolfo Hernandez, who wasn't only a right-wing politician, but also had a sort of Trumpian persona. He was, you know, a very um, successful um, developer in Bucaramanga, uh, city in the northeast of Colombia, close to the border with Venezuela. He entered politics as mayor of that city on a platform of anti-corruption and transparency. But over the years, he was suspended repeatedly by disciplinary authorities because of his character, basically. He entered into fights with council members, with the press, he was constantly using slurs, uh, xenophobic and misogynistic, uh, you know, offenses and, uh, you know, unpleasant words <laughs> against uh, his critics. And he has been accused of corruption in a scandal that is widely regarded as uh, Vitalogic. And it um, involved the contracting of sanitary um, support for the city of Bucaramanga for a period of uh, 10 years, which amounted to around uh, half a billion pesos. And he was allegedly trying to favor the negotiation on his son's behalf. So he was definitely not the most savory of candidates, but the anti-Petro movement in Colombia was so strong that he still garnered the support of over 10 million Colombian voters. Right, right. That, that's a very good context, Santiago, for the audience. And then, uh, well, my question for you would be that, why now Colombia is known to be a traditionally right-wing country. Mm -hmm. This is the first time uh, in history that we have a left-wing president. Uh, and to be honest, from a personal perspective, I never thought I would see that, you know, it's, it's very surprising. We have a very traditional country, uh, or at least that's where our elections showed historically, right? No one in the left had achieved to win and even some left wing ideological candidates uh, that had left leaning policies during the 20th century achieved to win somehow through traditional right-wing parties, right? So this is the first right. openly left-wing and very left-wing uh, candidate that won the presidency. So my question is, why now? What's different from the last 200 years? Yeah, well, first of all, I would definitely like to stress what you just said. In our Republican history, we've been governed mainly by right-wing politicians divided into the two traditional liberal and conservative parties. Um, even though there were a certain number of, let's say, reformist governments in the mid-19, in the mid-1990, uh, sorry, in the <laughs> middle of the, of the 20th century. So yeah, mid-1900s, um, such as uh, Lopez Pumarejo or Geras Vestrepo, uh, or even Lopez Mikkelsen, who were in a certain way, um, let's say, influenced by growing social demands coming from the worker unions, uh, women's movements, etc. They weren't really left wing politicians as such, uh, whereas Gustavo Petro certainly. <laughs> embodies a left-wing ideology, which I would perhaps position around the 
social democracy uh, that is uh, reminiscent of the welfare state in Europe after the Second World War, but which definitely seems to be like a breakaway with a very conservative, militaristic, religious, and um, yeah, land uh, owner past of Colombia. And I think uh, this has been many, many decades in the making. Um, so for instance, we had the experience with the Union Patriotica or Patri Patriotic Union political movement in the 1980s which uh, was uh, formed after a peace accord was signed between the government of President Belisario Betancur Cuartas and uh, the FARC uh, rebel group, which ultimately demobilized in 2016. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the uh, Union Patriotica faced a systematic campaign of extermination that led to roughly 6,000 assassinations and um, deportations of its membership and its political leaders. Amongst them, I suppose we could highlight very briefly uh, the cases of Jaime Pardo Leal, who was a judge, a very well-respected leader of the judiciary's uh, union, and a rather, you know, democratic, uh, open and transparent uh, candidate who ran for the office of the president in 1986, but was unfortunately gone down on his way back to Bogota in 1987. Then we had the um, case of, um, of Bernardo Jaramillo Osa, who was again, a very well-respected human rights lawyer who ran for the presidency in 1990 for the Union Patriotica political movement and was assassinated at the airport uh, in Bogota. And then we had also Luis Carlos Galán Sarmiento, who was certainly not a member of the Union Patriotica political movement, but who was also left-leaning and very, you know, conscientious about the situation of the majority of the Colombian electorate and was unfortunately murdered in 1990 as well by the Medellin cartel. This left a sense of grievance in large uh, swathes of the Colombian electorate. They were looking for ways to participate in a political system that had been traditionally closed to them by uh, urban elite composed of the few industrialists that exist in Colombia uh, landowners who possess over 50% of uh, the agricultural land in Colombia and uh, clients of, uh, you know, political leaders in both Bogota and uh, several regions. And I believe that uh, when the peace agreement was signed in 2016, this hope for a political openness, a more democratic society, was uh, palpable and uh, the difficulties in the implementation of that peace agreement as a result of a right-wing government that has also had recourse to armed violence uh, without any sense of proportion that has you know, not paid attention to the social needs of uh, the majority of the population and that handled the 2021 national strike very poorly led to a sense of, of urgency. We needed a change. We needed to break away with the elites that had been governed us for most of our Republican history. And uh, Petro and Francia Marquez basically learned how to uh, encompass those needs into their political agenda and how to provide a voice for the voiceless, like Francia Marquez constantly says with reference to a poem by uh, Galeano, los nadies, the no ones, the nobodies, they embody them. And I think uh, that's what uh, ultimately led to their election. In fact, if you look at a, an electoral map of Colombia, the majority of the vote for Petro and Francia Marquez came from uh, the faraway regions in the borders of the country, whereas the center of the country mostly voted for 
Rodolfo Hernández. So you could definitely say that it's a response to this sense of urgency for a change. Right. Right. Uh, I think that's a very, very good diagnose. Uh, uh, in addition to an and matched uh, participation in the election, right? So people who mm -hmm. never voted before, regions that never voted before, participated. So actually, people who never voted added to to this, and it's it's a very well the very demonstration of, of what you of what you say the the claim of of the mm -hmm. uh, least favored of the marginalized to, mm -hmm. to be included in in the government, right? Uh, also because a tipping point uh, was all right with the pandemic, with inflation, with, well, everything that's going on in the world, undoubtedly. Correct. Uh, now, let's, let's address what comes easily uh, in most conversations in, in, this, in this situation, right? And it's like, why is this or not a situation of Colombia turning into Venezuela and how big right. and they are different or similar from other left uh, wing leaders in the region? Of course, this pops up immediately and it was a recurring theme during the presidential campaign. I, what I would say is that as opposed to Hugo Chavez, who was an officer of the Venezuelan army who had already tried to overthrow the government by use of force. Uh, Gustavo Petro never partook in armed actions of the M19 rebel group. He was basically a promoter of their ideology in the Sipakira municipality on the outskirts of Bogota. Uh, he was, uh, you know, handing out leaflets and building a popular neighborhood. The problem was that he was doing so with a firearm on his waist. So in 1985, he was actually arrested by the military police. He was subjected to what nowadays would constitute a trial that is flagrantly in violation of human rights standards as it was conducted by a military judge. He was imprisoned for roughly a year and a half in which he denounces uh, to have been tortured and humiliated. But after that experience, when he demobilized as part of the M19's transition towards a political party, he made a strong commitment to democratic rule. He participated in the drafting of the 1991 Colombian constitution. He always had recourse to fair elections in order to gain his power. He was persecuted politically by former ombudsman Alejandro Doñez Maldonado. And even though he was unlawfully deprived of his seat as mayor of Bogota, he never called for anything other than, you know, recourse to, to lawful means of uh, conflict resolution. So he appealed to Colombian courts and to the inter-American system of human rights in order to be reinstated. And even though he's constantly, you know, compared with a dictator and made fun of for his stances, his political views, the, you know, even <laughs> appearance uh, that he presents himself with, he has always had recourse to dialogue and uh, to uh, an ever growing, you know, um, let's say moderate and uh, dialogical uh, approach to, to politics. Uh, so I really don't think that his sympathies for Chavez, which are undeniable, will in any way mean that Colombia is about to turn into another Venezuela. And in fact, I think it's quite unfair to try and, you know, venezuelize <laughs> the politics in the continent. The left is definitely more than just uh, Hugo Chavez. You can see how diverse the Latin American left is when you look at the government of Gabriel Boric in Chile, when you look at Alberto Fernandez in Argentina, when you look at Gustavo Petro in Colombia, they all have very different uh, agendas and views 
um, which ultimately only coincide in, you know, seeking uh, to build a more um, equitable society for their voters. And in the case of Petro, I think that one of the things that provides the most uh, guarantees regarding, you know, the stability of the country is the people he has surrounded himself with recently. You have Alejandro Gaviria, former presidential candidate for the center coalition. Uh, you have Mauer Lara, a very well-known journalist who also was a, a Senate candidate from the center coalition. You have a number of, you know, bureaucrats, uh, technocrats, uh, people who have, you know, skin in the game and who really want to make this a successful democratic government and not some sort of undemocratic regime change as we saw in Venezuela over 20 years ago. Right, right. I, I think that's very good from from the what we've discussed in this in this show the the authoritarian democratic spectrum mm -hmm. right which we think is the right one to analyze latin american even global politics not the left mm -hmm. or right anymore um also i would just like to briefly get your thoughts on also the economic fears that people have mm -hmm. regarding the first left-sided country uh government in our country mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to these people who are afraid of losing not only their riches but also of facing uh unforeseen inflation uh a tax charge that is higher than the ever seen and maybe not not see the benefits what would you say mm. to these people uh well first of all that um they shouldn't believe the propaganda about petro you know being about to <laughs> take over their private property if anything his um uh, program is very capitalistic in nature because what he wants to do is to increase the number of private landowners in the country by utilizing um, territories that currently belong to the nation, uh, to the state, um, either because they were you know, never in private hands ever since Colombia became independent or because they used to belong to drug traffickers or other types of criminals and you know they relinquish their right to to those lands during legal process so no you know uh, socialist or communist would ever promote such a policy uh, which clearly marks petro as a capitalist also of course he has a very uh, ambitious social plan which would definitely require uh, tax reform in order to you know, finance the social expense that he has in mind. But in that regard, I would say that this isn't a monologue, even though he has some ideas which I personally think are quite you know, worth looking at closely. So for instance, getting rid of unjustified exemptions on corporate uh, gains, um, taxing wealth, the wealthiest individuals of uh, society, which are a handful of Colombians, less than 1% of Colombians, uh, in a way that is progressive and not, you know, uh, entirely arbitrary, and um, also creating taxes to promote productivity rather than, you know, the, the grabbing of land for no purpose other than, you know, maintaining your wealth. Um, those policies will have to be discussed within his own administration. We are hearing that maybe Augusto Ocampo, Alejandro Gaviria, even Rudolf Holmes may become his um, uh, the secretary of, of, of uh, the treasury um, to, to make, you know, make it comprehensible for people abroad. Um, these are people who are very technical and who will not risk Colombia losing its gradation for credit or you know facing growing inflation. But also this will have to be discussed in Congress because any tax reform requires the approval of both the chamber, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So there is plenty of time for democratic debate 
to improve these policies and to make sure that they help maintain Colombian stability and growth rather than cause a spiraling crisis. Right, right. Well, Santiago, we think this has been very enlightening and you have set with great clarity the context and the main concerns and issues regarding, regarding Petro's election. Uh, in just one minute, any lesson, any final reflection you would like to leave to the audience, not only Colombian audience, but also the U.S. audience uh, relating to this? Of course, uh, that I was very uh, pleased with the readout uh, from the call between President Biden and President-elect Petro, because it shows that our strategic interests continue to align. We will work together implementing the peace agreement trying to curb climate change and promoting a, you know, free democracies around the region. So Colombia continues to be a key strategic partner of the US. I don't think Petro will threaten that at all. And what I would expect from Washington is uh, their ongoing bipartisan support as we've received uh, thus far. That's very interesting and uh, also very relieving. For, for our viewers in, in the US. Colombia, from what we see, will remain a, a, a key and close partner to the US. Santiago, thank you very much for your reflections. Uh, we hope to continue analyzing the situation. Hopefully we'll have a series with different people from different parts of the Colombian spectrum considering how unforeseen. I, I just want to leave the audience with this. It is the first time in 200 years of Republican existence that we have a left candidate and there's a lot, to, a left wing president actually, and there's a lot to unpack there, uh, unless a region surprises us with something more pressing in the following weeks, which yeah, let's hope very that. much would happen, is likely to happen. We'll see you in two weeks to continue discussing this. This was Latin American Directions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.